And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me is the is making his technical Geek Watch and monastery debut. Um, a man best best known as the one who asked the question, "Are you planet bound?" As well as well as the master of the fellas. Good. <laughs> Good brother Jack. How yeah, you careful. You're gonna you're, you're gonna get the fellas upset if you call me their master. One oh. of the master fellas. <laughs> oh pl oh please, for half of them that's probably their fetish. <laughs> How you doing, Mildred? I'm I am doing good. Um I had a bit of an encounter with turkeys this morning, just hanging around outside my office. Well, it, yeah, we got lots of them in Northern California. I promise you. Mm -hmm. um, to which, it, and I remember, I remember some um, asking my coworkers, "Who cursed me with these turkeys?" <laughs> and, some, and somebody said, "I, I did." I'm like, "Shame on you!" He's like, "You will appreciate the Turk." To which I immediately <laughs> said, "Oh, I do appreciate the Turk as dinner, <laughs> or as you know." Istanbul, that once was Constantinople. Thank you, Turks. <laughs> Don't fucking start with that thing. <sighs> but this is a return of a little a little side series that we did a that we started a while back with the eternal late and gay Doku, called mm. monastic therapy, because there are mm. some times where. Either myself or one of the, one of the dear colleagues here in the temple goes through something so bad and a show so terrible that they need to get it out of their system before before it lives too much rent free in their heads. Yeah, before it rots our brain. Mm -hmm. Now, last time we did this, it was with High Guardian Spice, which mm. um, the spice did not flow, and that thing is. <coughs> Going to be referenced for years to come as a master class in bad writing and yeah. bad animation. Mm. And what not to do to read the room because you went with a you went with a Western cartoon on a service that is catering to to weebs. Yeah. But this time around we're covering something that's supposed to be a little bit more classy. Because <laughs> We are delving into Amazon's short-lived venture into Robert Jordan's epic, The Wheel of Time. Possibly very short-lived, but we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. And before we even get into what went wrong with it, and there were many things that went wrong with it, I think we need to set the ground... F because of the fact that this is an adaptation and not, mm -hmm. a, not a standalone thing, I think we need to set the foundation before we even get into the TV series and what went wrong with it. And yeah, I agree. Now, the Wheel of Time is is one of those. And I'm, of, I'm I'm and just so I I'm clear. I'm there's things that I'm going to talk about that went right with it too. Yeah, but I think it. I think at the. I think on the whole, it's. Going, it's going to go down as a as a disappointment. Yeah. Um. And in at at best and at worst a blown opportunity. Hmm. Hmm. And as and as tempting as it would be to say that it, that it was a blown opportunity by being on Amazon, I can't really go with that approach mm -hmm. because no. there are there are good Amazon originals. Invincible yes. was good. Yes. The boys was yes. good was good to a point. Yeah. Um although I although I actually prefer it to the to the comic book version which is far more cynical. Mm. Um Reacher kind of those issues was, I had with both yeah, of those yeah. too. But Reach, it, does, Amazon, it doesn't mean that Amazon puts out bad things. Yeah, and Reacher was really good. In fact, I consider I consider that the best adaptation of Jack Reacher. Oh, I you know I haven't watched it. Mm -hmm. um, you will never go back to the Tom Cruise version again. I can guarantee you really? that. Really? Okay. 
Oh. I wasn't a big fan of the Tom Cruise version, but I wasn't either. But it, but at the time, it was a case of, well, this is well, you got to work with what you got. Right. But when you get something better, well, you know right. that you know what's going to happen there. I, that, I'll say this just as a caveat. That kind of goes for a lot of things that get adapted like that. When it's the only thing that's been adapted, it's the only thing that's out there. Wheel of Time kind of stands in that place of, well, God, it's the only thing we have of a visual representation of this book series that many of us love. Mm -hmm. And so it, it becomes exactly what you're talking about. Well, that's what we got. Yeah. Now that being said, just because it's what you it's what we've got does not mean right. that it is go that it is going to be beyond reproach because as I've no. stated in the past, I hold these truths to be self evident that all men are cremated equal. <laughs> Accurate. Now, with that in mind, when it comes I'd like to get. I'd like to go into a bit of my of my introduction to Wheel of Time, which is going to be a bit unorthodox. But I didn't get introduced directly through somebody bringing me the books. Yeah. No. Instead, instead, it was it was through the D the D twenty version, as well as the Wheel of Time song by Blind Guardian. Mm. Um. Now the Wheel of Time D20 book is one that I'm not going to be running anytime soon because I don't feel like going back to all of the bullshit I had to deal with with third edition D and D. Yeah, I mean I might use I might steal some notes from it, but that's as far as it's going to go. That works. Uh, but I ha but I have talked about that version when I had um, Stephen S. Long on the sh on the show, and. He he mainly took the, he mainly took the job of doing Wheel of Time D twenty as a gip as a gimme after Wizards of the Coast um purchased Last Unicorn who where he had worked with on Star on um Star Trek because mm. Stephen S Long is 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 while well, he's known by a lot of people for the hero system um right. he has just as much reputation when it comes to both the last unicorn and the Deci and the decipher takes on Star Trek. Interesting. Um, as well as the decipher take on Lord of the Rings, and he had told me that um, he had an easier time working with Paramount than he did with the Tolkien Estate. Ooh, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I don't doubt it. But he had he he had mentioned that reading the books for research. Was a interesting experience because of some of Robert Jordan's bad habits, which we will likely get into. <laughs> but between between that and also the short-lived card game, that was my introduction. Got it. I'm pretty sure a lot of people listening to this didn't even know didn't even know that there was a Wheel of Time card game, but there was at one point. <laughs> there was. Yep. Only because I loved the series so much did I know of all these little offshoot things, mm -hmm. including that wondrous comic book that was known. Yeah, I knew about the comic book. I just could never find it. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It wasn't if it horrible. Was... That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> so the so the kindest thing that you can say is that it exists. Yeah, it wasn't horrible. Yeah, but I'd I've seen I I remember when I was in high school. A lot of people compared we, com, were making, in my opinion, in my opinion, a bit foolish comparisons of the Wheel of Time to the Lord of the Rings. Oh no! And yeah, I don't think I don't think that's entirely fair, for the same no. reason that I've made it very clear I resent the idea that anything fa that anything fantasy has to be taking that approach. I've already told you about the Tolkien melting pot. Yeah. And that doesn't work. The mat the only thing that Wheel of Time and Lord of the Rings have in common is that they're both fantas is that they're both high fantasy settings with a Correct. emphasis on mythos. Correct. Uh, and you, I mean, well, you could po you could possibly make some real far reaching comparisons, but the stuff that Robert Jordan really. In, obviously got inspired from was not 
just derivative of that. There's so many aspects of so many things, including religion, including um, other mythos, like mm-hmm. actual mythos of, of, of human mythos, mm-hmm. uh, meaning ancient past mythos. Uh, that, that, that That's clearly what he was being derivative of, if anything. Uh, and so you'd have to reach pretty far when it comes to Tolkien, so I say. Yeah. If any, if anything, I'd I'd say that his inspir- even even though there is that um, Western European aesthetic, I'd say he I'd say he I'd say Jordan leaned far more into East was dipping more into Eastern mythos. Oh, absolutely. So I can use that. So we can use that to throw in the face of people who want to segregate um, East and East and West regarding storytelling. Right. <laughs> Well, it's one of the things that I really love about it, to be honest, is is the incorporation of so many things. You have uh, Norse mythos, you have Eastern mythos, you have Western mythos. You have so many aspects of, uh, 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 meaning uh, ancient Hebrew mythos, a lot, so much that's incorporated into this this construct called the Wheel of Time. And I will admit that one of the things that I appreciated with his mythos personally is the is be is being a fairly early adopter of the concept of dragons not being this ultimate villain. I mean so much of the mythos is built around the dragon reborn, which is more right. which isn't what people usually think of that concept. Right. Uh, I don't know if it's there but, uh, well I yes, so I don't know if it's uh, early early one but it is one yeah for sure mm-hmm. it's an outstanding one yeah as far as, I'm not going to say it was the first because that goes into a rabbit hole I don't feel like I'd no. be able to get out of right and whenever you're dealing with what comes first in um, anything mythology related you're you may you may as well take the two le- you may as well take the two liter challenge right I.e., drink two liters of any kind of beer and then throw a dart at a dartboard. There you go. Don't do the two-liter challenge, folks. If you do that, I take no responsibility for what happens. <laughs> I'm pretty sure your insurance policy won't cover it either. Yeah. But I would normally in these kind of situations, I would uh, I would ask what what the appeal is. But the tricky thing with a story like this is. That the, that the appeal can come from many avenues. But I'd sure, s- yes. <laughs> yeah. But I'd say I'd say some of the major ones is be is being a is being a a very a very strong coming of age story. Yes. And I'd say I'd say I'd say another I'd say another aspect is the fact that it was do, that it was doing mythologies in a in a way that what in a way that was more of a gestalt than than something that was focused on one subculture cuz as much as I sure. like Tol- as much as I like um Tolkien's in Tolkien's focus on on the on the mythos of the of the British Isles and Correct. some and some places outside of it um, Wheel of Time is more is the kind of gestalt that you you see you see a lot in honestly you see a lot in Japanese pop culture in a certain sense. Sure. Um, you know how like how like how the religious scene in J- in Japan is this hodgepodge mix between three between three or four different religions just crammed together all at once. Yep. You kind of have you kind of have that with the world that the Wheel of Time presents. Agreed. So that's that's why that's why I often say that while you could well it's certainly wearing the skin of what a lot of people consider high fantasy. That's where the comparison begins and ends. Once yep. you dealt once you peel the layers back, it's that comparison is not as strong. Yeah, I will say that that was one of the appealing factors for a lot of people, though, is that it it felt like uh, 
and and if I'm just roaming a bookstore, the covers look like, and this series makes itself appear to be uh, high fantasy. Mm-hmm. Oh, great! I'm going to get another great high fantasy series. You know, Tolkien, and we can name many others, right? Mm-hmm. And so, okay, this is a new high fantasy series. Let me check this out. Uh, that was essentially my introduction to uh, the Wheel of Time. Is it? It was up there on the bookshelf, real pretty cover, uh, Eye of the World, and um, then uh, it, it didn't really change for me. This is a, so why this series is so appealing and important to me is that it influenced my creative. Um, my it inspired my creativity on on so many levels the content itself but i got to meet robert jordan around the time that the shadow rising came out mm-hmm. and we sit, sat down and had a great talk and the reason i appreciate the man and his writing so much I, the stuff that the stuff that a lot of people will criticize about the writing that we may or may not get too deeply into uh i often find endearing because i just find the man himself endearing Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when I got a chance to sit down with him, he gave me two nuggets of wisdom that have been a mainstay for all of my creativity, especially around planet bound is, uh, I had him sign the book. In fact, I have the signed copy of sitting in front of me as we're, as we're talking. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he signed it in 92. So I was 16. I had created planet bound when I was 14. So it was two years after I created planet bound and I sat down with him and he had just come out with the shadow rising, which is the fourth book. And I said, so how many more books? And he said, I don't know, like two or three. <laughs> yeah, right. But he, but he said, but what I'm going to tell you, he said, sit down. And he took the time, this 16-year-old kid, he took the time to sit down with me. He's like, sit down. And so I sat down as he signed in the book. He said, but I'm going to tell you something. He goes, I know every word of, I, I said, he goes, I know every word of the last paragraph of the last book by heart. Every word. And I said, really? And he said, Jeremy, whatever story you're going to tell, without even knowing me, this guy, he says, whatever story you're going to tell, always know the end before you begin. And I said, got it. And then he goes, and the second thing is, I'm not going to stop writing in this world until I've written everything that I want to write about this world. So however many books that takes is however many books that takes. Mm -hmm. And I go, okay, got it. And so Sanderson, um, in a, I was reading yesterday, fun fact, I just read it yesterday. I had never read this interview with Sanderson. And they were going over things that he, what he experienced in going through Robert Jordan's notes. And he said the only thing that he had, because he knew he was going to pass away. So he had prepared the next writer, whoever that was going to be, with his notes, right? And he said the only thing that he had written out verbatim was the epilogue of the last book and the very last paragraph verbatim and could not be changed of course because that's exactly what he told me because i know the end before you begin and a lot of people talk about the ending of that epilogue and have mysteries around it i don't have mysteries around it i'm clear what he meant we won't get into it now but the but that's my endearing factor why i love this series so much because it it had me create the end of planet bound at that moment in time i went home and created the end of planet Bound before i begin and when i think about the series even now and as the game will come out this year guys Mm -hmm. uh the the uh I won't stop writing in Planet Bound until I've written everything that I want to say about the story. So he gave me those two nuggets of wisdom that I just hold so dear to me. And so this this series definitely has a special place in my heart for that reason. But over as, as a whole, just as, as fantasy and world building and um, telling the hero's journey, I mean, that I think that's a huge appeal. He told He tells the hero's journey with every single character. And there's like, a thousand main characters in this series, right? And every single one of them has an incredible hero's journey. He was just a master of arcing heroes. And, and whether that got, you know, drug on, like some people complain, or things were lamented over and over and over. If Nynaeve pulls her braid one more time, I'm going to flip out. Uh, stuff, yeah. He still was a master at it. Very, very well done. That does bring me to one of the one of the one of the problems that a lot of people cite with Robert Jordan's um, writing the the fact that he, the fact that he w- that instead of a web of characters he had something more akin to a tumbleweed and right. tr- and trying to, and doing a whole, and doing a whole lot of setup along with his 
issues with um, pa with pacing all of those moving parts. And I won't deny there is the possibility that in in some regards he may have get he may have gotten ahead of himself. Yeah, I'm not I'm not saying he did or didn't. I'm just saying that I can believe I it can if that was it. that if that was the sure. case. Yeah, and it's a it's a habit that that writers can that writers can have. So yeah. it's not so. In that regard, while I well, I agree. I agree that the character list can be can sometimes be a bit much. I also I, at the same time I don't agree with the idea of holding Jordan specifically to it when it's a easy problem for any writer. Sure. Oh. And in fact, in fact, that in fact, I'd say he's ha he's handled his a large cast of characters better than some writers I I can think of. <coughs> Martin, <coughs> I really I really need to get that taken care of. Yeah, get that one out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think it's for I think it's for that reason that when Sa that when Sanderson took over, he decided to. Um, Stack th to split the final book in two. Yeah, which ultimately may have been for the best. Sure, and uh, and I don't I don't know if he could have done it otherwise. Even though he was, so I'll say if we can, I'll briefly say something about the difference between. And I'm sure that you that you're going to preface a lot of this, and I'll just preface it here now. There's probably things that we're going to talk about uh, in this series that would be considered spoilers. I'll try to be you know cognizant of that but in the end it's been out there for long enough to where if you're listening to this the first book came gonna... out in 1990 i think right and the and the last book came out in 2013 right i think by this point the statute of limitations has passed i fully agree uh and uh, so the difference between the writing styles of these of these two gentlemen, uh, first of all, I will say that um, for the task that Sanderson had, I have to applaud the man. I mean, you 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 are taking a much loved series and a man who people cared about because of this series and because of his writing and not just the Wheel of Time, his other writing, too, but mainly the Wheel of Time. And you're going to be responsible to complete this epic uh for him uh, and for his fans uh and for the fans of the series and so just just that he took that on and did as well as he did i, I have to applaud the man uh he was much more of a concise writer right we got a lot less of naive pulling her braid mm -hmm. uh and though that it also for me lost jordan's um, voice in that, which was okay. I meaning in the end it was okay, but I love Jordan's voice uh, even even as as the, the aspects that people complain about, and so missing his voice was a tough one for me, mm -hmm. for sure. <clears throat> now, when when it comes to when it came to that when it came to the announcement that the Wheel of Time was going to be getting. A TV series adaptation that was going to be on a on um, Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. um, at when it was first announced, my attitude was one of cautious optimism, mm. Espe especially g especially given that when I looked at the people involved, I didn't see a whole lot of names that that screamed experienced. Mm -hmm. But I give it, but I give everything a ch I give everything a chance, and Buddha only closes his eyes three times. Yes, and I it, it, that in fact was one of the reasons that actually got me excited, is because okay, great, we have some fairly inexperienced cast, some very ex inexperienced producers, and maybe just maybe these are people. And this is one of my, you know, we'll talk as we go through this. When you're adapting anything, meaning you're interpreting one medium to another. And very often, when we're talking about that, we're talking about interpreting a book, a comic, a graphic novel into a, a medium like film, a animation, uh, sometimes animation to film is another one like live action. Uh, so often, uh, when, when you're translating medium, 
I, I think the a very important aspect, there's several important aspects to me, but one of them is that you very much handle the original medium with love and care. And you can tell when that is done. When you have a content, original content and then something is being done with original content that is done with love and care, i.e. for Star Wars The Mandalorian is a great example of that, seasons one and two. You could tell the people involved really cared about Star Wars and really cared about this um, story and really, and then you have Book of Boba Fett, which was, okay, let's have this great idea and throw it out there, um, but we have not taken care of this character. We do not, we're not taking care of the, the love that people have for this character. There, there was no obvious finite care for for the character or the or the story they were going to tell about the character. So that's what got me excited. I'm thinking, okay, brand new people, maybe these are just people who effing care about Robert Jordan and that's why they were picked. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're going to just produce something with love and care. Yeah. So it actually got me kind of excited to see this, you know, fairly fresh cast, fairly fresh producers, people involved. Mm -hmm. Now, supposedly, I... Um, live action adaptations were in talk were in talks all the way back in 2000, which may have been a little yeah. premature. Oh yeah, me. but Correct. truth but truth be told, this happens a lot where talks of of live of live action adaptations of a book um, are are op are optioned. But oh, yeah. some a lot of times the op the option is brought up by a studio and nothing comes of it. Um, or it gets thrown and crashed heavily by, especially by fans. I think a lot of studios that I've heard and read articles, they react to the fans going, oh, what are you talking about? You're going to try to, especially something like The Wheel of Time, you're talking about a serious undertaking, 14 massive tomes mm -hmm. into a, 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 a show. Holy smokes. You know, they talked about it as a movie at one point too. Like, and, and I think the reaction from people is you just can't do it. Um. Or you can't do it well. I think, well, um, hold hold that topic for one moment. Okay. But I say I say premature lar largely because I'm not a fan of adap I'm not a fan of adapting works in progress. Even um, even going back and rewatching Akira, I can't help but notice all the things that that differ from the manga. Right. Because the film was 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 made when before Akira had actually finished its um its its run in manga. I think yeah. it was in Young Animal at the time. All that was okay. really finished was the first two volumes. And yeah. if you've seen those big ass volumes of Akira going into That's what any I'm saying. Store, exactly. Yeah, if they had tried to do it prematurely, that would have been a poor. It, it would have really, I mean, and there was ways that they Game of Thrones did that we'll talk about anyway, and that was Sanderson's comment, but the the Game of Thrones is an example of that. You know, it's not done yet, yet we're moving along with a, a TV series. And with some, with, uh, now, whenever it comes to that, I know some, I know some people will bring up, um, the the various adaptations of ongoing manga into uh, into anime form and that is a that is a very special case with very special circumstances because originally you had it you had weekly stuff going but but um, in order to give writers time you would have you would have filler episodes or even full filler arcs you don't have that as much nowadays nowadays um, no, you have a very stop-start thing regarding seasons, right? Which ultimately is for the best because nobody likes any of those filler se seasons or any of those filler yeah. episodes for various anime. Um, Agreed. But but um, try but trying to but trying to do it in two thousand, even if the first movie of sorts came out in two thousand five, it would have still been a little bit early unless. The, Unless there is a whole lot of um, collaboration, yeah. Um, but the reason I said that sometimes these things get optioned and nothing comes of it, because that's exactly what happened with a novel series that happens to be one of my personal favorites, mm. um, Tales of the Otori. Okay, I don't think I've read it. Um, it is a very is a very good um, samurai fantasy mm. by Liam Hearn. 
It okay. originally was a trilogy of books. It got one. It got one sequel book and one prequel book, as well as a prequel slash spinoff call. Um, that t- that takes place quite a- that takes place in the early days of its story, but mm. that's a whole o- that's a whole other series. The mo- the movie rights were optioned by Universal several mm. years ago, and I have heard nothing about it since. Yeah, and as far as I'm concerned, that particular project is in development hell. Yeah, I kind of felt that way about the Wheel of Time. They had talked about a- an adaptation of it for so long. Uh, that even when they were talking about this adaptation, I really didn't believe it. Mm-hmm. Even when they started mentioning the people involved, I'm like, okay, well, great. Uh, that doesn't mean anything because I've seen projects that have people involved that get dropped too. So let's see. It was, I, I still was kind of licking my finger and, and holding it up in the wind to say, we'll see. Mm-hmm. Now, with that in with that in mind. I, one of the reasons why why I could easily see why some why someone would consider doing film adaptations is because of the runaway success of the Lord of the Rings movies. Except the problem the problem with that is even though you have you have several tomes with the Lord of the Rings, for all intents and purposes, you only have three. Sure. As opposed Unless you do the Hobbit, and then you make, and then you just fill three. <laughs> well, this, well, the Hobbit wasn't e- wasn't even a factor at the time. Sure. And I do know that a t- that TV options were sold in two thousand. And to be fair, the early two thousands was around the time that NBC was experimenting a lot with these miniseries ideas. This is where you got stuff like Merlin. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think that after Lord of the Rings, there was a real push for fantasy uh, adaptations. Yeah. Um, I don't know. This is far enough along to me that I don't know if it's directly derivative of that push. Um, but it easily fell into, hey, these things have been successful repeatedly. People like adaptations. Um, we aren't creating any new content. This is This is one of my bigger beefs with any adaptation is okay great we're not creating new content of anything we're just regurgitating stuff uh so i have a general overarching problem with the fact that we seem to be made of a culture in america where we regurgitate any because we are not creating new ideas so we're just finding something that was popular at some point and let's find a way to put it into another medium or look at it through a new lens or to, you know, explore it from a different facet. Uh, that come, is not great. <laughs> I don't want. I don't want to delve too much into that, but um, I I will say that when pe- when people lament that issue, they're only looking at one half of the problem. Okay. Um. The other the other half the other half, and I've I've called out plenty of people about this over the years. Is whenever mm. somebody talks about oh all, all that Hollywood is doing is re- is remakes, I a- I ask them, when's the la- when's the last time you you went out you went out of your way to watch, read, or listen to something outside of your comfort zone? I, I totally agree with that. That is the other half of the problem. Absolutely. And when was the last time? And you mentioned this often. And I'm just going to say this as a caveat because we want to go on to deeper things in Wheel of Time. But you often say this when it comes to gaming. If you're going to complain about it, if you're going to say something about it, what are you doing that's any different? Or where, where, what are you doing? Cre- are you creating content yourself? Because guess what? We, we live in a, a place where we can create content on our own and, and there's a lot of ways to self-publish. So what are you doing that's different other than complaining? You want to know what the nickname I have for people who compl- complain about nostalgia yet th- yet indulge in it themselves? Mm. Linus. Because <laughs> that's what I see. Linus sucking on his thumb yep. with his security blanket. Yep. Yeah, they can't let it go, but they don't want to do anything different. Um, I've also used the analogy of a dog sitting on a nail. Mm. But... 
I, but that's that's an issue that I've t that I've talked about plenty of times over over yes, the years, okay. and I don't want to I don't want to belabor the point. But yeah, yeah. even even with that whole two thousand thing, if you if one were to look at the history regarding regarding the project that we ended up getting, you see a lot of hot potato. Because <laughs> mm. yep, unsurprisingly, mm -hmm. and and to me that speaks to. This is so. This is one thing that I will give them. They took on what I consider to be a monumental task. Mm -hmm. This to to do any adaptation of fourteen tomes, <laughs> meaning in hardback, eight hundred plus page books, and to put it into a television series. That is an undertaking, and and the the the. The bravery, uh, I want to say the balls to even do something like that, is pretty wow that they um, even really moved forward with it. I, I'm i a big fan of the Prey novels by John Stanford. Mm. And when that has gotten adapted into film, I knew that was going to be dead on arrival because you think for, you think 14 books is bad? Um, the, Pre the Prey novel series has more. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I wonder about things like that. It, it makes me wonder mm -hmm. if they should even be adapted into mediums. But I will say that when when you do go about it, there's just criteria that I have. Number one, you have to love it, and and that was one of my first things about the Wheel of Time is every single episode had a different director and a different writer and a different adapter. Every every opening credit scene was completely different. The only thing that was the same was the cast, and I was like, "Oh, holy smokes! This this is not being taken care of from one to the next. This is all very individual. Mm -hmm. The last person did what they did, and this person was handed what to do next. And and I, I thought, oh, you you really put some burden on these people." story it's almost like here's your part of the story adapt it have fun and fit it into an hour you know it's like wow that's how you handled it so as soon as i saw that i thought wow the approach was obviously not one of uh, a group of people that had a genuine care for the series at least from my perception and maybe that's not accurate maybe there was some sort of internal source that i'm unaware of but it seemed to be that it wasn't a group of people that had a genuine love and care for this book series that were going to carry it all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, for me, having having people handle d handle writing, adapting, and di and directing on an episode by episode basis, what that t what that tells me is a ship without a captain. Yeah, because since since um. Since we brought up Lord of, since we brought up the Lord of the Rings movies, let's consider the fact that with those movies, all roads lead to Peter Jackson. That's right. Um, with the with the Mandalor with the Mandalorian, all roads led to John Favreau. Correct. Or or to Filoni. Correct. Mm -hmm. To them as a pair, really. Yeah. For and. You, when you're taking on this kind of when you're taking on this kind of project, the only time you can really do the individual directors is when you have something that is serialized, where you have a collection of individual stories. Yeah, Star Trek is a great example of that. I mean, you can definitely have because you're telling very individual stories. It's often not story arcs unless you're getting into the newer stuff. But uh, when it was very serial, meaning this is episode by episode by episode, you could have different directors, and it didn't matter. Different writers, different all of it. Mm -hmm. Granted, when it comes to television, I find that the writer has more authority than the director does. That's not to say directors don't have authority. It's just that um, writers have a bigger say in terms of the episode by episode direction. Sure. And I would say that that's probably the case in this too, because they they didn't really necessarily have the writer. It was it would, they called it an adapted by, uh, and then they would have the person's name for each episode, and it was a different person per episode. But the problem with having that many pe that many people in the kitchen is, well, as the as the saying goes, too many cooks spoil the broth. But at least everyone's sure. to blame. Yeah, and in this kind in this kind of case. Because of the fact that you don't have somebody to 
to be to be that unifying force. A lot of people are just going to do are just going to do their do do their thing. Mm -hmm. And you have and when you have a story that's supposed to be continuous, yeah, that's not something you can get away with. Makes it ever so challenging. And 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 I don't know. Of course, we don't know the details. At least I don't. Like, I've never read the details of why the actor who played Matt, which his name is escaping me at the moment. Uh, why he left the series but i can imagine that that could be a frustrating aspect as an actor too like i have to deal with an entirely new crew essentially telling me what's brand new for my character now the and it's not going to be necessarily consistent with what was the last time we were filming i remember i remember be i remember speaking to someone who had who had directed a directed a lot of tel a lot of television for nickelodeon back in the 90s Mm. And one of the things he said was that it's important to have a series Bible, whether mm. you're doing an mm -hmm. adaptation or anything like that. Some, Absolutely. Some sort of document that you can point to and say, these are the characters we're working with. These are their arcs. This is the world that we're, that we're building. Yep. To make everything consistent. Yep. Plan About has one. I have a, 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 a very extensive Bible. Mm -hmm. And... I know. So, I know some people might bring up that you have that you have multiple writers, writers and editors when it comes to comic books. Um, I'm not a fan of that partic of that particular model in comic books either. Yeah, correct. And apparently, apparently, the, apparently, the audience is either. If you look at the um, if you look at the if you look at the diamond numbers in terms of what graphic novels are actually selling. Correct. <laughs> yep. It's, That's right. The ones that end up selling are those ones that are consistent. Well, and not not just that. Um, the major the market share when it comes to graphic novels these days is dominated by manga. Oh, and, it sure is. Well, with a, with a lot of manga, you usually you usually have one usually have um, one set of writers and editors. That's right. Oh, it's it's very consistent. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think, that, so I'll go on a point that I feel like they did do well. When you're translating or interpreting mediums from one to another, the other thing that I think is important to consider is know your medium mm -hmm. and be okay with the medium. Uh, and that it can't be the medium that you're coming from. They are different mediums. A, a novel is told and, and produced in a very different way than a television series or a film is. One of my favorite examples of that is Dune, the original 80s Dune. Tried so hard to take what Frank Herbert did in that novel and put it on screen. And while they did do some visual aspects of it, there was so much dialogue going in and on Paul Atreides' head. Because that was what was happening in the book. So they didn't know how to translate from one medium to another. So they just had ongoing dialogue inside Paul's head constantly. Mm -hmm. And so... Instead of knowing that what your medium is, so the current adaptation of Dune, which I actually cared for very much, the the you know instead of having Paul have this long conversation of Arrakis in his head, he's watching uh, what is it, a, a projector, which totally tells me something about the world. We know that this world comes from a place where um, technology is all um, machinery, meaning it's not it's all analog. Uh, because of the android well, we don't need to be told that but we know that paul is watching on a projector and he's and that's the projector's telling me what the thoughts we normally had about arrakis from paul in the first adaptation and in the book so knowing what medium i'm putting it in and adapting it with something that feels this is my third point about adapting a medium or adapting from one medium to another if there is a difference it should feel of course that projector felt of course because that fits into the entire universe of dune the projector wasn't a thing in the book but it, it fits in perfectly for what they were trying to do and not have thoughts in Paul's head. So know your medium and, and any adaptation to that medium should feel like, of course. And I, I feel like there's a lot of ways that they did that really well. Uh, knowing that they were going to a visual medium, for example, the, the Aes Sedai being clothed in the color that they were, that they, the color of their Aja. Uh, that's a great, that wasn't that way. I mean, they had their shawls, but they didn't always wear their shawls in the books, but, but having a visual representation of the blue Aja, the green, the whites. Okay, great. Now I have a, and their rings being very specific to that. Great. These are visual representations of what's in the book. And it feels, of course, it feels like, yeah, well, of course, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. There was a lot of that that I really did appreciate. Even weird, you know, as they got into, because one thing I'll say about Robert Jordan that was a big, that a lot of, you know, that he did, and I think he did very well, is he told a very, very uh, clear story about the relationship between men and women. Mm -hmm. I think that that's one of his, uh, uh, whether people think he did it well, people think he did it poorly, he definitely had uh, uh, that relationship between men and women as a part of his story. That was akin to his story. Mm -hmm. And when they adapted that to, to what we would now, modern day American culture, so how do I take this very, very male and female story and make it appropriate to what America likes today? Well, you could do what care about the book so much that you just leave it as is, or it has to feel of course. So the some of that stuff, like a lot of that stuff, could be assumed, like gender roles and things like that. For example, the warders and whether they slept with each other or not. Uh, Moraine's relationship with uh, uh, Siwan, Th those felt of course because they were alluded to in the book. We have the Aiel in the book, and they have sister wives, so polyamorous. Uh, type of relation these things exist in the wheel of time even in the books and if they're not directly said you could probably assume some of those things were so so showing them on screen felt like of course mm -hmm. so i was okay with that stuff the stuff that felt like of course i was good with yeah. and if you adapted it to the medium called television okay i'm good yeah now one one particular it one particular issue that I that I ended up ha that I ended up having. And I'm cur I'm curious as to your take regarding mm. the adaptation was aging up so much of the cast when this is supposed to be a coming of age story. Sure. I felt I felt that now if it was a if it was a case where where the ca where um the casting could could no for some reason or another couldn't allow for young actors, which I have a hard time believing that. Mm. Um, I'd be at least willing to buy it. I mean, I, I, I mean, growing up w watching Power Rangers, I dealt with teenagers <laughs> that clearly were not teenagers. Right. I, there's been so many examples of that, right? Teenagers that weren't teenagers. I mean, the '80s were nothing but that. Mm -hmm. But at the uh, same, at the same time, I feel, I feel like it's it's kind of hard to do a coming of age story when you already have. A, ca a cast that's over that t that is clearly over that particular age yeah over that hump and so then it does okay so here, here's my take on it here's my take on the cast period so you have this very uh again we're talking about modern america so what they and this is something i'm going to give them props for meaning the whole production of this thing that i'm going to give them props for they have this very very diverse cast that they chose uh, the Rand and everybody from the Two Rivers was white folk in 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 Robert Jordan's books, and uh, in the film adaptation they're not. But it still feels like, of course. And the reason that it feels like, of course, and I really like it, is because uh, number one, it fits into the mythos. You have Manetherin, and you have people that have the old blood, and you don't know where the old blood comes from. So you can imagine that the old blood looks all kinds of ways, and it's a mix mash of people. Right. Mm -hmm. And so for it showing up very diverse in the old rivers feels like, oh, yeah, I can see that. Of course, it's the old blood. Um, so you can see all kinds of stuff coming from the old blood because we really don't have a story about where this re this old blood. Where does this come from in ages long past? We don't really have this this extensive history of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, OK, we know about Manetherin, though. So great. Now I can, they're showing up this way. They also did not virtue signal. And I cannot give them enough praise for that. While it was talked about, meaning when they first announced the cast, people all over the internet were definitely talking about, oh my gosh, look at this cast that's, that looks how they look compared to how they're described in this book. They did not virtue signal about it. They didn't go, look what we did. Look what we're making. Look what we're, look what we're including in this. Look at, we've got Moraine's going to be with Siwan and, and the warders sleep with each other. And, 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 and look at how diverse the cast, they did none of that. And so I, I love when something just shows what's so, and it feels like, of course, and you don't virtue signal about it. So I have to give them super props that they, they did that because there's so much of that that goes on out there uh, in adaptations. Um, Marvel. Uh, and otherwise, <laughs> that, that that they do nothing but virtue signal. 
and it's and it makes it so much weaker when we could have accepted i i'll use captain marvel as a great example of it because i really enjoyed captain marvel because i went and saw it without hearing any of the what they had done about it meaning any of the virtue signaling that had already taken place and it was just like i'm like yay girl power movie i'm loving all the music from the 90s and i just my kids are having a blast with it and i enjoyed the movie until i see all the virtue signaling and it totally diminished the value Mm-hmm. Uh, of the movie intensely. So in any time Hollywood does that to me, you really diminish the value of what you've done. And they didn't do that, so yay. Um, when, it t- when it comes to what you're talking about, the age range, when they do a cast like that in a coming-of-age story, yes. Uh, you, you, have, you did adapt the interplay between men and women, very naive to Lan, to uh, Rand and Egwene, Rand and Egwene um, Matt and how he would interplay with girls. But in the story, they're, you know, teenagers coming of age. And so ha- seeing adults act very catty and especially Rand and Egwene, I'm like, come on, you guys. This is like, you're acting like teenagers and you're like clearly in your mid-20s. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It, there was a disconnect. So I, I will give you that. There, if you're going to tell that interplay between girls and boys and and romantic relationships of any kind during that period and you're going to really exemplify that in the going back and forth between characters then they should probably be age appropriate and it shouldn't feel weird or out of place i have been very critical of the writing styles of what i refer to as the club whenever they try Mm. and write relationships because i think the people who 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 are within who are within that club um, don't under don't understand people, and because mm. they don't understand people, they don't understand how to write um, relationships except through a warped lens. Mm. Now, I think speaking on casting, I would like I would like to, I would like to. Obviously, we can't go through all of the cast regarding this. No, that would we'd be here all night if we did that. Right. And I already did an all night stream last night. Oh, but I, but I I will say, I will give them this is that there was nobody that I was like, no, that is, you are so far off that I'm not okay with it. There was nobody. Uh, There was ones I liked more than others, but there was nobody that I was like, that is so far off. I'm just, I can't even watch this. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to give, I'm going to, now I'm going to stick straight with the main um, cast members for this. I'm going to give you the char- I'm going to give you the the name of the character okay. and I want you to consider the actor or actress who play- who played them and I want you to mm-hmm. give me a grade between A and F. Okay. Um I had considered making this into a tier maker but I but I couldn't get the right photographs <laughs> I wanted to and I and um I just felt like it would be too much of a hassle. I'd rather <laughs> save tier makers for a different episode. Brilliant. So, um, Moraine. Uh, she's the one I'm going to give a D. Okay. Why? Uh, so I, I have such fondness for Moraine's character. You have this, uh, strength in a very, in how it's described this very petite woman, uh, who is um, so so not appearing to be, but comes off so regal. Now, I did like the actress the more the show went along, but from the get-go, the entrance of Moraine and her initial introduction, and probably a big part of it, and this is a big issue that I have with the series period, is her first using the One Power and how That's, she used the that One was... Power. The way that the one power was treated is one of those things that def. That it's a is, huge problem for me, de- and I can definitely I can definitely see it, especially with how, the, especially with how j- not only that but the dark one is was framed early on. Yes. Yeah. When it came to the past age, um. Yeah. Randall Thor. Uh, I'll give him a B. Maybe a C. Maybe C plus. <laughs> I... He wasn't. He wasn't bad. The the uh, he. Uh, I think that he looked most coming of age of all the guys, <laughs> and, you know, and so it felt more genuine to Rand uh, 
uh, he he definitely had Rand's emotional, you know, ups and downs mm-hmm. uh, very very well. Um, and the guy looked the part. I mean, I I really felt like, oh yeah, that's definitely Rand in my head. The vibe I that get... I, the vibe that I kept getting when I asked around was. He looked the part, but the writing didn't help. Didn't do him any favors. No, it didn't do him any favors, and I wonder even more so whether the directing did any favors to him. Yeah, because often, oftentimes, there the policy of don't necessarily blame the actor, blame the director can apply. It's not a universal thing, but it is no. something that can, that can happen. Oh. It is something that can happen, and especially when you have such brooding c- characters. I mean, these, I mean, they make fun of it in the show, and they make fun of it in the book. Even, I mean, you have these three brooding guys a- a- at various times, and to to get that down is a challenge in itself. And if your director is not going, "Hey, buddy, uh, you feel like your whole life is ending because this girl is not interacting with you." the way you thought she was going to interact. Those, those were my parts that I had the hardest time with Rand is when he would react to a Gwen, like he does in the book, it did, it felt like him like overreacting to it and not in the brooding way that Rand I felt did in the book. It wasn't as, it didn't feel like he was hurt. It felt like he was mad. And in the, in the book, it was clear that he was hurt, not mad. Mm-hmm. Um, Perrin. Uh, so I'll, from episode one, maybe one and two, I would have given him an F. Into the series, it, it, ta- it went, once they get to the Tuatha on, and how he, when they show him interacting with Egwene at that point, it felt like Perrin. It started to feel like Perrin. He started to walk like Perrin. I wanted to feel, it, 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 I wanted that guy to feel like this big, Hulk, you know, the, the way Perrin was described in this book was so awkward and so uncomfortable with his size. And you didn't get to see the guy's size even really until we're like three episodes in. And then we have actual pan outs of his whole body in comparison to the other cast. And you go, oh, wow, this guy is big. Oh, yeah, he is walking awkward. That should have been shown right from the get go. And they didn't. And again, I, who, I'm, I'm going back to the adapters and the directors to go, this is the epitome of that character. This character is uncomfortable with himself. This character thinks he needs to protect his friends, but is also uncomfortable with his size. Why are we not showing that at all it, from the get-go? We do much later, and so I was more comfortable. I'd give him probably a C to a B like Rand later on. Mm-hmm. Um, Nin. Uh, Min, uh, uh, I'd give her a B. The, the, my problem with Min was what, what they chose to do with her necessarily. She shows up in Faldara and how they introduced her and, and the interaction with her was very not the book, right? And uh, Min, I did appreciate that the actress was, you know, smart alecky like Min, um, uh, un, you know, uncomfortable with her own ability like Min. I'd give her a B. She did good. Mm-hmm. I more had the problem with the storytelling yeah. aspect of where men came in. Um, and that we didn't have, also I'll say it here because we're mentioning men, and that we didn't have Elaine at all <laughs> to mm-hmm. have this. We're going to start introducing the three women and eventually Avienda that are going to be attached to Rand in a very particular way. And we're starting their introduction here. And Elaine is a huge, and we don't even go to Camelin and we don't even have any of that at all. That, mm-hmm. that, was a big downer for me. Yeah. But um, we have men for some reason. Matt. A. A plus, in fact. Uh, the get, the guy looked way too old, like you said. I mean, he was the oldest looking guy of the cast. But man, he nailed Matt. A plus. He, 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 he was my favorite character. It was such a bummer when I realized he had, when, when he didn't go into the ways with them and that it was an obvious funny shoot. I'm like, what's happening here? And then reading that he had left the cast, and I was like, oh my gosh. That guy was the best guy you had. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I yeah. loved that they added aspects of, you know, his parents being alcoholic. There was things back, there was things that they added that were of course about Matt and made him uh, that, that character that was Matt. I mean, he, he, he was Matt for, they gave him reasons to be Matt, but that was the character. It was really, uh, again, I love when they translate a medium and it feels like, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, Egwene. I'm going to give her... I'm going to give her close to an A. Like a B plus. Uh, that... Egwene is, to me, a tough character to play in general, I think. Um, to play opposite Rand. Uh, I, I think there was a lot of challenges. And I think that that actress did well. I think that she looked probably a good age for a queen, you know, talking about the age thing. She, she looked a little bit younger, which was nice uh, to, to see for a queen. And um, I think that the actress did a good job for what a queen is, which honestly, and this is, I'm not, this is probably one of my criticize criticisms of Robert Jordan. I never thought a queen was a strong character. I just never thought she was, you know, and she's the, well, I was about to give a spoil alert. She's the only one of the main cast who dies. Right. And so the, so you, I really, you know, I, I just overall always expected more of Egwene. And I'm like, why does she feel so throwaway throughout this whole series? And she's such a main character. Mm-hmm. So it was a problem with Jordan's. So I think she did best with what Egwene is. Yeah. She did good. Um, Lan. Uh, I, I got to give that guy an A. That's a tough character to play. And I think that he did a a good job a good job he had to play parts opposite Nynaeve that were a big jumps in the series we know um which came way too soon for me but that's just because I know they don't come that soon in the series um but I get that they if they had if they had left it as a setup like they did in those first few episodes as to something that would be eventually but they went full throttle they were like sleeping together by the end of that book or by the end of that series so mm-hmm. I'm like okay we're just going there with uh Lan and Nynaeve so story-wise, I, I don't know, but I think he did good for the story. I think he was probably a little more emotional in those aspects of it than I like to see uh, land. But he was that he did a good job of being that stoic guy. So I think the actor was good. Good cast. Mm-hmm. Um, and last, Elaine. Uh, Elaine, she wasn't in it. Um, Elaine. You talking about naive? Huh? You talking about naive? Yeah, unless, unless unless my notes lied to me, <laughs> it could be. So Nynaeve is is the other main girl character, right? Mm-hmm. So she's the one with the braids, uh, mm-hmm. and so in the so there was so I think that she did a great job. Nynaeve is a I love to hate you character anyway in the book, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody loved to hate Nynaeve. She was constantly pulling out that braid. I I thought that they should have done that maybe a couple times more. She only pulls on it once in the whole first season right and it only happens at a very particular time it happened like all the time in the book anytime she was frustrated she would pull on that braid and it reminded her it was a link to her being part of the woman's circle and in, in the two rivers it was a link to her past it was a link to keep her stable was that braid in my womanhood and who i am as the wisdom of the two rivers and they didn't play that up enough again i would i can't blame the actress the actress was really good you love to hate her she was really bitchy like naive was in the series so i can't blame the acting i would more blame you know i don't know if they wrote or directed her uh well enough to represent uh, naive, but the actress was great. I'd give her a B plus, maybe even an A. What I do think that they're going to do, if we want to go there, where I think that they're going to Game of Thrones this series big time is her character. I can go into it now, but uh, it's that's up to you. Well, since since I was going to be shifting into that, we may as we may as well go into that. Part. Yeah. So the series is is we're talking about the Wheel of Time, right? Or excuse me, we're talking about. Um, Eye of the World. So that first season is essentially the Eye of the World. Um, Now they took their liberties with that and there's lots of things in the other books that they brought in, especially Lan and and Nynaeve's relationship so early, right? Mm -hmm. Nynaeve is such a... So one thing that they did right from the get-go that I got real clear on is that Moraine comes into the Two Rivers and says there's five Tavirin here. 
no, there's not Moraine. There's three Taviran there. Uh, but we're going to expand this conversation around Taviran to include Egwene and Nynaeve now. And Moraine starts talking. I'm like, okay, okay. And now we're going to start, say, the Dragon Reborn can be any of these Taviran. Uh, the Dragon Reborn can be, be reborn as anyone. And, and can be, we don't know who it could be. It could be male, it could be female, we don't know. The Dragon Reborn could be anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've set, some, we've set a precedent. Um, and at first I thought, well, they were just doing that as a way to adapt to what um, modern american uh, movie and storytelling and television is going towards so we're going to make it less about male and female and make okay well it could be anybody it could be the dragon reborn i thought it was more of that at first until that last episode which is just honestly the series i could have done okay with the series until that last episode that last episode is what killed it for me that, and particularly go ahead that seems to be something i hear quite a bit that yeah even the people who liked the show yeah have a major problem with the last episode of the season yeah it killed it for me so i think what they're how they're going to game of thrones this is they've already set the precedent that it could be anyone and i think the twist that they're going to give us that is going to be the alternative to what robert jordan and, and sanderson wrote is that nynaeve is the dragon reborn that it's not rand so they set up this whole thing towards the end there that she does this something in crazy powerful where she sucks in so much of the one power from Egwene and the um, other Aes Sedai, the, well, the, the, the former Aes Sedai or the, the one who was uh, one of the accepted at one point. She's pulling so much of the one power from them and she's the one that wrecks the Trolloc army at, at Tarwin's Gap. Uh, and, and Rand is just down there and has this sort of confrontation with Elzaman, um that doesn't include any of the Forsaken. That whole everything about, th that whole everything. So Rand and then Rand being declared, you know, he's a male who can channel. Got it. He's, he's you know, Moraine's like, it's got to be the dragon. The dragon has been reborn, which is the same line as the end of the Eye of the World. But I don't think that that's where they're really going with it. I think that they're showing how powerful Nynaeve is is because they're going to set this up to 180 us like they we're going to tell a brand new story called Nynaeve is that we're actually the dragon reborn which if i'm being if i'm being honest that feels like um a twist for its own sake correct which is something that i'm not quite a, not quite a fan of and i do it could there could be a various reasons for it i don't think because some people have suggested possibly that that's you know they wrote matt out meaning they they didn't they they had to he, he leaves the set they they do this kind of you know weird take with him at the ways to to get rid of him at that scene they read shoot all of the scenes after that including everything that happened at fall dark so you know perrin rand all of them going and matt going into uh tarwin or into the blight and everything that happens there well okay now we're sh you know everything that's happening with uh, the girls is a result of that because they couldn't have everybody go in together. So we're just having Rand and Moraine go, uh, okay, well, we're just adapting the story because we didn't have Matt. I don't buy that. I think that they fully intended to have Nynaeve be the one who was powerful enough to suck in that much of the one power from these other two girls, almost stealing them, uh, in the process and, or even killing them possibly mm. and wrecking the Trolloc army while Rand, uh, and who knows if that is what caused, you know, we don't have say we don't have, there's so much that happened at the eye of the world that was just so inconsistent with what we know. You know, we don't have the material representation of Sadin in this liquid form of pure Sadin there that Rand can, can pull from that also one of the forsaken is there, um, uh, pulling from, um, Agenor is pulling from. Uh, we don't have the green man, so we're not. We don't have. We don't have any representation of the other Forsaken, so we haven't really introduced this concept. All of a sudden, Balesamon is there, and we don't know really who he is. But and and uh, you know, uh, Queen Dr. The the Heartstone that's sealing the the uh, Dark One is the big floor. Okay, I can buy that. That can be in, of course, and it breaks. Um, I, but we don't. We don't have any real big epic thing that that Rand comes to the realization that 
that he really is a man who can channel and the devastating consequences of that like is this crushing thing at the end of eye of the world to him as he comes to after using Sadin to wreck this trolloc army it's such a powerful moment in rand's story that takes him down a notch 10 notches because he realizes at that point he's a man who can channel and what that's going to mean for him and Moraine re- coming to the conclusion that he's the dragon reborn we have none of that instead we have Nynaeve as the hero of the day and Rand really didn't do anything why you know so I I think that they're setting that up for a reason um I have a the the when you describe it in that manner what com- mm-hmm. the term that comes to mind for me is hot shotting. Mm. Um, and I, and this is something this is something I've seen. You see it in you see it in wrestling sometimes, and you see it in writing in other times, especially writing mm. um, over a period of time of throw, throwing all throwing all the stuff in the wall at the at the wall to try and put mm. some sort of teaser to the what happens next because. An issue that I've had with um, web with web series in the in the wake of Netflix and the like mm-hmm. is that instead of instead of building to a conclusion, mm-hmm. the the build is to a what happens next question. Correct. It's, and yes, it's to, the build the, is to the cliffhanger always. While there are while there are some stories where you can make that work, and where it's appropriate. There are some. There, it is something that is relied on far too much. Yeah. And 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 having and introducing something as big as the Sean Chan as at the as the very end scene was a bad idea because number one it looked like garbage. It was probably the only thing when it talks when I talk about adapting a book to another medium like a visual medium. Again, I have to give them so many props. There was so much about it that looked and felt like the things that I read. And if it didn't look exactly like it, it felt enough like it. The ways, for example, felt like the ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and okay, I'm I'm buying it. I'm buying. It. And then you show this really cheesy CG weird. I don't know what with these boats and these people that look so silly. In this makeup that are supposed to represent this, the Shan Chan, I, w- I was like, no, that was stop right now, please. Already we have a very disappointing end, and then you give us that as a cliffhanger? No, no. Mm-hmm. Poorly done. Yeah. And there is one, there was one bit of gaslighting that I heard after the, after the season ended that I do want to I do want to touch on because this is something I hear in regards to adaptations quite a bit and especially book to film or otherwise adaptations that has always <clears throat> annoyed me there is this red herring that fans of a book will only be satisfied with a one to one adaptation that it, that fans of books who com- who complain about adaptations are purists no no, I disagree entirely. That's so. That is gaslighting. You're right. It ver- it very much it it it, be- it is. You can either see it as gaslighting or as a red herring because sure, yes. most of the people who are critical of certain changes are not doing so in in the expectation of a perfect adaptation. Largely because no. one, you can't do that, and two. Sometimes when you try and do that, you end up with a worse product. And the examples yes. that I always bring up in this regard is the film adaptation of Cormac MacArthur's *The Road*. Now, could you oh. do could you do a film adaptation yeah. of *The Road*? Yes. However, the problem is *The Road* as a book is more and more often than not atmosphere and mood making, which sure. it does very well. Yeah. The problem is that kind of atmosphere and mood making, which you can spend whole pages going into in a book, can be summed up in a film in a single frame. Right. A single frame, or at mo- or at most, an establishing shot. Mm-hmm. And those are the kind of shots you give to the second unit director. Yeah. <laughs> and all the more, all the more so, you shouldn't you shouldn't try and do it over the span of two freaking hours. Right. 
And, and, and it's the same thing with Paul's, you know, conversation in his head in the original adaptation of Dune. You, 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 you're, you're dealing with a different medium. So number one, if you know you're dealing with a different medium and you're true to that medium Mm -hmm. in your adaptation, number two, if the medium you're true, saying true to feels like, of course, meaning it's consistent, it feels right with the world, any adaptation or changes just feel like, of course, yeah. And three, if it's clear that you cared about the source material. Another, Meaning that you took care of the source material. Yeah, another another example that I get that I give regarding the, regarding this um, fallacy. Since we brought up Star Trek, I feel I should bring this up. Mm. The 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 one of the the only the only episode of the original series that won a Hugo Award, even though the writer involved absolutely hated it. City on the Edge of Forever. Oh, yeah. Now. Harlan Ellison is science fiction's grumpy old man. Yeah. <laughs> by right. his, by his own admission and by the admission yes. of his colleagues. I think Isaac Asimov said he has he has an inability to suffer fools gladly. <laughs> and he in his life freely admitted that he is a bit of a cantankerous yeah. sort. Yes. But it's it he did not like the way the way his script was changed in the yeah. in um in the episode that aired, yeah, and he made he made that explicitly clear in the foreword that he wrote when he published the original script as a book. Mm-hmm. And um, it's a great book, by the way. Yeah, it is. And a lot of the issues that he had with the changes weren't that weren't that it was changed from his original script, but rather the nature of those changes and what and the kind of story that he was trying to that he was trying to tell. With with it that did that he felt wasn't expressed. Yes. Supposedly the only reason that he t- that he even accepted the Hugo Award is because is because Roddenberry threatened to have him blackballed. <laughs> that sounds like Roddenberry too. Yeah, and while while Rod while Roddenberry had well Roddenberry certainly had his talents, he was no he was no saint. <laughs> no, <laughs> and no, he was not. And, of, and admittedly so again too. Mm-hmm. But in the, but with but a lot there were certain characters that he that he expunged and and that were expunged and certain storytelling elements that were expunged. And I do agree to a point that that uh, to what DC Fontana had said that maybe the story would have been better served in the Outer Limits, which he had also mm. done written episodes for. Mm, yeah. I can for see, the feel that he wanted with it, sure. I can, but on the other hand, what about the trouble with Tribbles? That hardly fits in the most stringent sense, <laughs> right? So, so I I can see, and I actually I can see where Fontana was coming from, but I don't quite agree with her. Oh, yeah. But the, but the point the point is is that with each of with each of those stories, with each of the um. The, those issues. It is not. Ju- it is not just they changed it so it sucks to reference TV tropes. A lot of times, yeah. the ch- the issue with the change is the in- is in changing one thing. You can- sometimes you can alter the intent of the of a given story. And yes, there's there's the whole debate about how, about maintaining the intent with an adaptation that. Gets lost in the nuance when you're ca- when you're calling people purists, and I know why it's done. It's an easy way to try and dismiss because saying saying that you don't like how it chi- how in in doing these changes it do- it you end up creating a whole different story than what you're supposed to be adapting. It's far it's a get out of jail free card to just call someone a purist. Right, it is a get out of jail free, or or to you know if I say. Uh, uh, in this, in the situation with Nynaeve and what she, her being the one that defeats the Trolloc army instead of Rand at Tarwin's Gap, oh well, you're sexist because you didn't want a female to do it. That has nothing to do with it. Was, what, <laughs> I, gaslighting in that way because uh, it, 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 there must be another reason that you, you didn't like it other than the reason that you didn't like it. Well, the reason that I didn't like it is it didn't feel like the book. The whole end of this season did not feel anything like the end of the Eye of the World. The other, th- the other factor is um, 
when doing these when doing these kind of things, if you're going to introduce a major change like that, then mm -hmm. you have to be prepared to deal with how you're going to write out the consequences. And if I'm being honest, I don't think they thought that far ahead, especially with possibly, the lack of a possibly, especially I, I, with I, what you mentioned about the lack yeah. of a captain. Right. True. That could be very much so. If 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 we don't, if we truly don't have like, maybe they're not even thinking of this twist that I've come up with <laughs> about nine years. <laughs> maybe they're listening to this, going, "Oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> we'll just go with that." Yeah. Who knows? Uh, it was just it was just a poor choice. I'm not, I'm not really sure what their um what their motivation behind it was. I don't think I've... that I've seen it expressed anywhere. I don't think I, I I don't think I'd be able to say what their motivation is. This is just my suspi this is just my suspicion based on what's based on what's presented in front of me. Mm -hmm. Is the f the fact that they the fact that someone someone thought that they were that they were more of a writer than a than an adapter and decided to mm -hmm. do and decided that they want to do a surprise at the end of the season. Yeah. Uh, which, if they were writing their own thing, I'd have no problem with that. And yeah, but um, there is of, there is of course the whole debate about how certain certain very bad writers seem to have this idea that we need to trick the audience. Yes. Oh, uh, and I know I know it might sound like I'm bringing up the whole subverting expectations that Roundhead wanted was insistent on, but I'm aiming for more than just that. My amb I am far more ambitious. Okay. Because I am also putting my aim I'm also putting my aim at say Disney insisting on twist villains. Yes. Um yeah. I I'm I'm not against the idea of the t of the twist villain or even a twist no. ending. No. But the thing of the thing about the thing about doing twists is that Ideally, everything everything that you've seen up to that point should fall in, should fall into place with what you're seeing at that point, and that, yes. that you were just that all that it was there right in front of you. You just weren't look. You just weren't yes. looking at it yes. at the proper angle. Yes, um, it shouldn't feel like, huh? What just happened? The obviously, obviously, the king of this kind of thing is going is going to be twi is going to be the Rod Serling era of Twilight Zone. Yeah, but. But even into the '90s, things like uh, Fight Club and Suicide Kings and Snatch and, and movies like that, you have these odd little funky endings and th weird things happening that are just like, "Oh, we didn't realize that that was that guy the whole time." Mm -hmm. Yeah, that works. Yeah, um, I'd say I'd or say for even, a lot even of even as far as you know, uh, uh, I see dead people. Why can't I think of the name? The, of it? the Sixth Sense is what is Correct. what you're thinking of. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know the. The t the it's funny I bring that I find it's funny I bring that up because um well well a while back we did a whole episode roasting over an open flame the work of M Night Shyamalan <laughs> and that would have been fun oh uh, well the if you dig back in the archives you can find it it's called from Maestro yeah, I'll, to I'll Moon. enjoy that one oh <laughs> uh, and there's a there of course there of course is the f is the fact that with the within within a story that ha that has a twist, um, as I said as I said before, everything has to fall into place up up until that point. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's it's something that's easier done when when you're dealing with a mystery, because you're not supposed to be seeing all the pieces all at once as the story right. progresses. Yeah. And it does work well there, but it doesn't have to. The, like in this, something like this, you know, yeah. Uh, the reveal of Rand as the Dragon Reborn to himself, which really doesn't happen until book three, when he takes um, Kalendor, meaning the, the sword. Mm -hmm. uh, why, you know, okay, we could you can build up to stuff. Uh, Moraine can realize it at the end of that. I, I don't know. The, well, yeah. If they wanted to go the route of and of anyone could potentially be the Dragon Reborn, yeah. then the thing the thing that should be done in that regard, and I, 
I I putting aside the, putting aside the fact that false dragons are a thing are a thing. Right. That, right. That's not that's not important to what I'm getting at. That's not what we're talking about. Yeah. What you're effectively presenting in that regard is a whodunit, and in a yeah. whodunit mystery, every single suspect could ha- could potentially have means, motive, and opportunity. Yep. If you're going to have it that th- that there are multiple people who could potentially be the dragon reborn, you need to get you need to make a strong case not for one of them, not for a couple of them, but for all of them. All of them. To agreed, and that was a real missed opportunity if they were going to do that. You're right. To use another example, um, I'm going to bring up a a entry from Castlevania. Okay. Um, specifically. Um, Aria of Sorrow and Dawn of Sorrow. Okay. With Aria of with Aria with um Aria of Sorrow, which is absolutely fantastic, mm. the be- the best of the GBA era of Castlevania. Yeah. There, there. One of the big mysteries is the is whether is um the idea the idea that Dracula has reincarnated it in the in into into a new into a new body, mm. and Graham believes that he is the reincarnation, and when you end because of the fact that he is one of the two people in the story, the, the other one being Soma Cruz, who has the power of dominance, mm. i.e. i.e. the the soul dominating power that Dracula has. Mm. Of course, after beating him, depending depending on what sort of souls you have, the revelation is that. Soma himself is the reincarnation of Dracula, oh, and that's great. The per- and the person and the person who knew about it the whole time is Ge- is Genya Arikado, mm. who just with just who they don't even try to hide who he actually is. <laughs> mm. But in the sequel, Dawn of Sorrow, which is pretty good but not quite as good. Mm. A lot. All of the bosses are people who were bo- who were born in the same year that Castlevania was sealed in an eclipse in 1999. Okay, and each of them could be considered a candidate. Okay. the The point I'm, I bring that up to kind to kind of show a parallel mm-hmm. that if you are go if you're going to do the whole anyone can be it, you need to. Put, you need to put that mystery in the minds of the of the audience. That's right. Even if it even if it's just something that might, it you could ar- you could argue you you could argue that it sh- that it's something that shouldn't be shown. I yeah. disagree with that. It can either be it can either be someone claiming they are. It could be it could be someone oh, showing a power anything. that they that they that they normally shouldn't have. The point Seriously. of the matter is at, the point of the matter is um. You put just enough of a seed of doubt that any one of the any one of the potential people could be the dragon. And Rainbow. while they and while they did do that in these very very small clips where Moraine would just glance at each of them, well, that's not enough. No, and that's it, my, my, my <laughs> that's only enough to piss people off. Correct. And my family members uh, who had never never read the Wheel of Time, my kids, my sisters, we're all watching this series together, and like. Two episodes, three episodes in, they're like, it's Rand. <laughs> like, duh. I'm like, I, and I'm the one that kept the mystery just by going, well, you know, and then I was saying things about the other characters, and they're like, oh, that's true. I'm the one having to give them the mystery, not the show. <laughs> and you're not even getting paid for this. No, and I'm not even getting paid for this. I have to mention this one other thing that just, this is the thing, this is my big, big problem with this the the adaptation when again when you're talking about using your medium the visual medium it was a huge miss for me the one power the the one power as it's described in the books when you could have done that visually to me in so many ways but i have a very specific way that i can see it in my mind that they could have done especially from the vantage point of the channeler which absolutely should have been done. If we saw from the vantage point of the channeler, weaves being made, weaves blending into each other, instead of these wispy white things, and or black things at some points, mm-hmm. that, come on, 
that that is a, the weakest way to do the one power for me. And 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 then, it, and it, right from the get go, when Moraine used it in the Two Rivers it, to take down the Trollocs, I'm like, this looks so lame to me. That scene was so epic in the book; it felt epic. And if we had seen from Moraine's vantage point, Weaves being created you know, in front of her, from her hands, because I, I know that's the thing for the Aes Sedai. They're moving their, they don't have to, but they're moving their hands. So if if that's the thing, if she's moving her hands and we see from her vantage point weaves being created into, you know, and being clear that, you know, the, the, the one power is a challenging thing. You're talking about weaves of earth, wind, fire, water, and either its spirit being made to into whatever they're they're doing to do whatever they're doing. There's so many ways that that could have been done a good example is the opening of the show. The opening of the show when they're actually showing the 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 wheel weaving and and strands of the wheel, uh, meaning people being woven into the wheel, and then it ends up being you know these these eyes that eye of all the ajas in the in this in this great tapestry looking thing uh, inside the wheel. That's a okay, great. That's a great visual representation of the turning of the wheel and the pattern and. What a cool way of doing that. And then the, the snapping of one, you know, understanding we're talking about people. I can, even without knowing any of that, I still get that feeling from it. I got no feeling from the one power. I didn't care at all. Anytime they were using it, I was rolling my eyes. I'm like, I don't feel anything. This is just boring. Uh, even when, especially when you're dealing with Loghain and, and when they, um, uh, when they uh, gentle him, meaning when they forcibly gentle him, mm-hmm. which of course... I don't even think that that happens in the book and I'm, and I'm going to have to like go back in my memory to either, you know, separate this. I don't, I think that they actually bring Loghain to the white tower before he's, maybe that's not accurate. I, uh, maybe I'm not, no, no, no. I'm thinking of when they still see one and, uh, and, uh, uh, the keeper of the Chronicles. Is that what they call her? Uh, the one who's the second to the Amarillin Sea. That's what I'm thinking of. No, the, whatever happens with Loghain is whatever happens with Loghain, right? Between Leandra and, Okay, that, that that visual representation of that was really poor. It's like splitting apart for him. I was like, that doesn't how does that what are you how what are you representing? Nothing's being like cut. Nothing's being removed from him. It's just you're making weaves go in two ways out of him. I don't even understand what's happening here. It just it looked funky and for such a powerful moment and it actually was a cool moment in this the show to see this happening you know in in everything that happens and in in and the people that were involved and adding a scene where lands almost dying and naive saving him and therefore okay we know she's this really powerful channeler Mm -hmm. even though that doesn't happen in the book the the still it gives okay we have all these opportunities here but the one power as part of it was weak weak i just felt it was really a missed opportunity when they could have really shown they, that was the miss from one medium to another. It didn't feel the same whatsoever. It wasn't mm-hmm. enough course. And in this, in the, in the vein, in the vein of, in the vein of that, I'd before we get into before we get into the next cha- the next chapter of this. Mm-hmm. Um, given all the talk about the about the one power. I would like to de- I would like to delve into what you think is the one spot where one spot where if the if they didn't make this mistake the there prob there probably wouldn't have been as much of an issue with the with, with this adaptation of the wheel of time. It really comes down to that last episode. Them not having the whole group go into uh, the having Rand and Moraine go in there alone, and everything that happened at the Eye of the World. It, it, that that just you you have a you have a everything is either okay or yeah, of course, all the way to this grinding halt. And I mean, it was a grinding halt. While there was kind of a a weak episode before that too, just everything that was going on in Faldara and 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 Lan and his supposed family, um, that's not really his family, but they consider him so because he's the last of his, you know, last king of Malkir, and and then his relationship with Nynaeve and that all that happening, it still was it was it was all of a sudden the show got really droll 
And then you have this very weak ending that had nothing to do with the original source material. Not nothing to do, but uh, uh, it didn't feel like the original source material at all. That's really where the breakdown ultimately was for me. Anything before that was either okay or, yeah, it works in this medium. Or, yeah, of course. Uh, I, yeah. Even the Tuatha on. I know people had some issues with that. But really, I thought, man, okay, I'm buying this. This this works um, in a in a visual adaptation of of the um, Tinkers. Okay. Um, the ways, uh, even loyal, uh, meaning the Ogier, he's described very differently in the book. Uh, his eyebrows, the way he twitches his ears, uh, things like that. Uh, his uncomfortableness. But the guy played him really well, mm -hmm. and uh, it looked like, okay, in a visual medium, I'm buying him as... And I'm watching, especially I'm watching my kids' reaction to this the whole time. And they were good. They were enjoying themselves and into it and making guesses on things and guessing even things about the book based on what they were seeing. So I'm buying it. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And then grinding halt. They were like, what is happening? The whole end, the second to the last and very much the last episode, it just all went. Mm -hmm. So anything up to that point was was manageable. I, uh, I Of course, they had to write Matt out, but that was, ugh. Matt in the ways was a big deal because he had the dagger still. And, uh, no, no, he didn't have the job, but the taint was still on him. So his interaction with, um, uh, the, the, the wind, much and shin, uh, was, it was this really interesting dynamic and you didn't have any of that. So now Matt's all the way out of the picture and he was a very important part of the three tape and being there at the end was very important. Them together, Matt Perrin, because they are the three tape and And in this case, if they're going to do five, okay, great. They've, at the points where this is the most powerful is when Tabirin are close to each other. So we don't have any of that. We have them all separated at the end of this. And so it's just the whole concept falls apart. It doesn't feel like the, this doesn't feel like the wheel of time anymore. Mm -hmm. Now with that, in, with that in mind, I'd like to go over some of the comments that Brandon Sanderson had made on the matter. Mm. And get your get your input sure. on, on the matter. So the first one comes from an article that was way back in December with his um crit with it with him taking issue of the way ne the characterization of Nin and Thom and the tink and the introduction of the Tinkers. Hmm. And this was on his um this was on his blog post reg regarding it, and he first and he he had been doing episode he had been doing feedback on episodes in kind of pairs. Okay. And this was although he I did didn't read any of his feedback. Yeah, by he the way. he did say that he didn't provide as much feedback on episodes three and four as he did for the first two, because okay. in his words, these two episodes were already quite strong by the time they got to me, and I didn't spot any major structural problems or character problems like okay. I saw with the first two episodes. Right. He then went on to say. Biggest thing I disagreed on was Perrin's wife. I realize that there's a good opportunity here for Perrin to be shown with rage issues and to be afraid of the potential beast inside of him. I like the idea, but I didn't like it being a wife for multiple reasons. First off, it feels like the disposable wife trope. Beyond that, I think the trauma of having killed your wife is so huge, the story this is telling can't realistically deal with it in a way that is responsible. Perrin killing I off his wife. Perrin killing his wife, then going off on an adventure, really bothers me, even still. End quote. I agree. I fully agree. Uh, it was it was so shockingly traumatizing just to see it, and even knowing everything you know about Perrin from if you're a fan of the series, knowing what they're why they're doing it to to show everything that Sanderson just said. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to show he has rage issues. Okay, we're going to show um, the trauma of something that he really wants to withhold his rage issues about. Well, you could have done it how it was in the book. You just had to pan out a bit and show how big he was and show how uncomfortable he was because of his size. There was other ways to do it. The book did very well, and it could have been adapted just as well to film. And I totally agree that that's something way too traumatizing to even be able to... Perrin would have been a basket case 
truly a basket case. And he was a he was sad, but he wasn't a basket case on the level that I would expect a guy who killed his wife, mm-hmm. even accidentally, <laughs> to yeah. be. He had suggested instead instead of his wife to kill Master Luhan. Okay. Saying, as much as that I hate be, that, to do, that, we, yes. He said, that as, worked. as much as I hate to do Luhan dirty like that, I think the I, the idea Rafe and the team had here is a good one for accelerating Perrin's plot. Accidentally sure. killing your master steps the trauma back a little, but gives the, the same motivations and hesitance. He yeah. also said, one thing I don't want this World Wheel of Time adaptation to try and lean into it is lean into sorry is lean into being into a tonal Game of Thrones replacement. I.e., I don't want to lean into the quote unquote grim dark ideas. Killing Perrin's wife felt edgy just to be edgy. Well, I don't know about that, but I I can, I, I understand what he's saying. Uh, I I don't know if it was edgy just to be edgy, but I it did. And I understand them wanting to accelerate uh, parents' character. When you're... There's so many other things to explore about Perrin that we didn't... So a lot that we get to learn about Perrin is in the interaction he has with Elias, the, meaning the wolf brother that he actually meets and under, you know and, and interacts with and, and who is and his initial understanding so we have we do maybe have wolf or uh, long thing or long tooth i can't remember what his his, his wolf name is but the the guy who ends up being the the sage character to parent for his for his wolfness uh for his wolf brotherhood he that character doesn't even appear number one so we have it's so him elaine uh, uh, and the green man don't even appear. And those are big plot points of, of the eye of the world. Mm-hmm. And, and so not having, not having that, they could have explored parents character in just other ways. I feel it, it, it didn't need to be that. Um, and I do think that they should, there's something else he said at the beginning of that, that I, that I was thinking of, but uh, if they, they definitely uh, to do things just for the shock value is not something that, that works in the wheel of time mm-hmm. as a whole. He so did. it felt, it did feel out of place. Oh, I know what it was. Perrin being married in the first place made then Perrin be this weird, awkward person that was potentially cheating in his head with a Gwen in his mind. And so that puts this weird other aspect of Perrin because he does have feelings about Egwene, and then he's with Egwene alone. And so that's when you see Perrin's character, because Perrin is very protective of Egwene. It did have feelings for Egwene in the book, but now it feels creepy because he was married, mm-hmm. and he killed his wife, and now he's showing with Egwene. So now it feels weird. Yeah. He did admit that the scene itself um, was solidly acted and shot. Oh, agreed. But he... But he's... Th- but... It, but it is. It was still in it. But I don't think he bent on the issue of feeling like it was going to be leaning into um, grim dark. Which um, I will say that that was the point that my younger sister actually stood up and walked out of the room. She goes, "Nope, can't do this," and she didn't watch the rest of the series. She's yeah. like, "Nope, that's too much. Sorry," and she left. It could win um, that. Happened. Everybody else screamed. Like my kids and my other sister, they were like, oh. "They were like, that is." awful oh my god i can't believe that just happened and my other sister she just walked out of the room she's like nope we're not doing this uh, this the spoiler warning that issue that he had about grim darkness would not be the last time that props up because mm. he said regarding episode three i'm the voice on the team that is pushing for a little less grimness and a little more hope in the episodes they're all turning out rather gory Mm. Though I wouldn't have chosen that, I'm not opposed to it in the context of wi- of Wheel of Time, as my gut instinct says that Robert Jordan would have felt the violence appropriate. I personally yeah. didn't want to see people being ripped apart by tro- by Trollocs, but it's suggested sometimes explicit in the text, so it's not something I can complain about. Correct. Um, he then said, However, while I don't mind a darker tone in general, particularly if it helps... These series keep dramatic and emotionally charged. The Wheel of Time is about hope. I think there are times where this adaptation goes too far, mostly in character beats. Okay. Um, 
Maybe, but there was a lot of hopelessness to these characters in Jordan's writing. Sanderson didn't, he wrote them with a little more hopefulness. So maybe that's his own take on it. Uh, but there was a lot of times that they were genuinely hopeless uh, and felt very lost and very out of touch with everything. So uh, those beats I liked, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know. The, I, don't, I don't know if I feel that one. As far as the dark stuff is concerned, you know, where they're showing, it was all implied, you know, the Inquisitors and, and them cutting up uh, Perrin's back and uh, just really, really grim and upsetting things they're t it's totally implied the trollocs doing what they're doing eating each other tearing people apart it's all talked about um they were just we don't see that's the thing about one medium to another you you do realize you are going to see some of the stuff that is talked about or at least hinted at we now have to visualize this stuff because the hint spark you know that sparks the visual of it in our mind even if it's just hinted at well they can't just hint at something unless they just have dialogue, which again, they're trying to translate one medium to another. So I have to, I like that they showed stuff to, for you to go, Oh my God, that's how horrific the Trollocs are. They eat think, each other. I think I can see what he's, what he's trying to get at. I get the sense that his issue is not with the showing, but how it's shown. I e got it. You, showing it is one thing, but showing it in a way that feels... Um, it definitely it, felt very graphic. Sure. Felt, I was The word I was actually going to use is gratuitous. Yes, you're, you're right. There were times that it did felt, it felt gratuitous. Mm -hmm. And there was, it was definitely over. And I just thought, well, that's, this is what they're going... And, and again, I have to agree with him, because that's immediately what my brain goes to, is I think Robert Jordan would be good with that. Mm -hmm. And he said the same thing. For some reason, I think that Robert Jordan would be would be okay with how that was represented. But for me, it was gratuitous yeah. at times. There was it was unnecessarily bloody, unnecessarily um, entrails. <laughs> now, when it comes to the introduction of the Tinkers, he mentions the advice he gave to Raph about it, saying, "Okay, do we have to?" He's, he he said to he had said they told Raph. Do we have to make the people following the way of the leaf into ominous dark figures in ragged clothing with terrible dogs? I really feel like this one is going to rub fans the wrong way and make the series try so hard to be dark and ominous all the time that it starts to be too much. It feels like the story mm. is really, really try is trying really, really hard to say, look, we can be like Game of Thrones. Notice how like Game of Thrones we can be. That's not letting it be itself or be the Wheel of Time which has light sequences and characters who are genuine friends and strong world building. Yes, and. <laughs> so the what I will give it is, so it was clear that, you know, that Robert Jordan was very influenced by certain cultures and peoples and mythos in the, the telling of things. And it's very clear that the Tuatha'an are... Um, uh, Irish gypsies, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the name, the Tuathan, you know, is, is completely derivative of, of, um, I think the giants of, of Ireland. I think oh, that's the, what they call it. Oh, the, that. And there's history with the name Tinker and Tinker. Yes, correct. Uh, and so the, uh, the, and, and portraying them is, is this very, very, uh, um, gypsy like, it's totally appropriate, and and the, and the way they talked about the way of the leaf was completely. That's just how it was talked about in the books too. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, and then you get to that part where the you know children of the light show up and they're like beating the tar out of them as they're going to chase Egwene and and Perrin. Uh, I don't believe that that happens in the book, mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, you're going to kind of show this. Uh, very upsetting thing. Um, but I do think that, you know, they, they got to a point where, you know, they, where the Tuatha, where the Tinkers had stopped and they, they started, you know, they were dancing and they were showing that lighter side of them. So I don't fully buy into that. He did and, like, uh, the rest will... of the, he did, he did like the rest of the Tinker scenes. Okay. Um, and, and said, but his, his main issue was how they were with, was with how they were introduced saying, so yeah, my, own, my only gripe remains in the ominous approach. It's a small yes. thing, but I think it's something to watch for in this adaptation. 
as the story is walking a line between being authentic to the Wheel of Time and going for that darker tone. Yes. So I, I would definitely agree that... So even when they were showing the gratuitous stuff, I felt like, yeah, well, I think that they thought that... Excuse me, that this was going to be expected of them considering what we had in Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, I, I, it doesn't. It can be just the wheel of time without needing to be anything other than the wheel of time. That's a good, good point. Yeah. Um, he did. He did have some things to say regarding Nan attempting to kill Lon. Okay. Um, saying quote. You mean Nynaeve attempted yeah, to kill Lon? Yeah, Nynaeve. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um. I always have a weird relationship when it comes to pronunciation, especially when I don't have a pronunciation guide in front of me. <laughs> no problem. Um, and he has a very, very ex- ex- you know, explicit pronunciation guide to his uh, books. Mm-hmm. I have to have one for Planet Bound 2, though, so I get it. Yeah. Because um, he, he had he had liked the dialogue, but said, however, to give you fan reactions, I think they're going to hate... Nynaeve actually trying to kill Lon here. This feels out of character for her in the books. She is a healer to her core. Sure, she'd kill a Trolloc, but a man who is doing his best to explain himself, even if she thinks she he's an enemy, not a chance. I feel this introduces her on the wrong foot. If you uh, ha- he, he then questioned, yeah. if you have her do things like this, what is going to separate her from Egwene and Avineda, both of whom have would have totally stabbed in that moment. I understand wanting a grittier story, but I feel contrast between ca- the, t- the characters is important for distinguishing them, and I feel this is not something Book Nynaeve would do. No, I agree. It's not. Uh, and that's, again, me feeling like they're setting Nynaeve up to be something very different uh, in this in this adaptation. She's she. They have really framed this between her and Rand for her to be the main character. She she is she is clearly the one repeatedly, even from the beginning when they have that scene when they go back where she's hiding in that pool. I mean the scene that, that I don't believe re- that I recall happens in the book and then kills the Trolloc. They're really setting up Nynaeve to be this powerhouse and she is a powerhouse in the books, but in a different way. Um yeah, and I'll get I'll get to that I'll get to that in a minute, because that 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 is that brings up an issue that I have regarding how certain writers perceive the idea of a strong character. Mm. But I'll get to but like I said I'll get to the, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, he had also taken issue with Th- with Thom's in- with Thom's introduction. Yeah. And he had told apparently he had told Judkins after reading the script, fans are going to be very relieved to see Thom here. I was kind of yes. confused as to what I'm supposed to read into the interaction with Thom and the beggar. Like, are they working together on robbing Matt, or did Thom spot him doing it and force him to give up the pouch? Could you make this more clear? And honestly, if we're supposed to like Thom, why does he take all of Matt's money rather than some of it? Seems like he's just kind of an asshole. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so th- this one I'm going to give huge props to the actor. That actor, I give him an A plus for representing that character. That character, talk about a challenge to play that character. Uh, and I think that they visually represented him really well, and I think the actor did a fantastic job of representing that character. That being said, what are we doing with this character? Uh, you know, if he, if he is, he j- the, the whole interaction with Matt is, you know, Tom and Matt have a lot of interaction in the books that it's their relationship is really important to who Matt's character becomes. And so setting that up is important, but how are we setting it up? Okay. We have this weird thing where we introduce the Aiel kind of in a guy with a cage where we're going to steal a jewel from this, which is weird, weird and random and inconsistent with the Aiel. Like, why does the guy have a jewel on his belt? And why didn't anybody take it before? It was really kind of a random thing, that interaction with Matt. And and, and it was maybe supposed to be showing something about Matt's character and also something about Tom's character. But Tom, you know, he eventually is, uh, in, in part, a love interest of Moraine. So I don't know if they're going to explore that later. 
and he, the the character really just disappearing. Um, I don't know. It was. I, what are they going to do with this character? This character is very relevant in the books, mm-hmm. and there's a lot to this character. And there's very, it's very layered. And so introducing him and even showing him, I was surprised and happy that they were doing. Um, because I'm like, I thought, I thought by that point that Tom showed up, I didn't even think they were going to have Tom in the, in the, in it at all. It seemed. Yeah. Um, so even having him was great and the actor did great. So I think I was banking more on that, but Sanderson's right. Um, he, he did come off as kind of dickish when it came to stealing Matt's stuff. And I don't know what, what, what were they really trying to portray about this character? Is he even going to show up later? I mean, what, what are we doing with this character? Mm hmm. He's not a throwaway character in the book, so it's in the series, so it's just kind of funky how they're doing it. I think I think that further goes into the theme we've been establishing tonight. But yeah, he would then he would then go on to say, not to sound like a broken record, but that's the running theme of the show for me. Great dialogue, good visuals and adaptations, but everyone is unlikable and kind of an asshole. Can mm-hmm. we have at least one character like Thumb? Matt is the only person in the show who, so far who has shown any really likable traits, and the scene yeah. just serves to make a fool out of him. Yeah. Agreed. And yeah, you really, you really care about these characters in the book. And I, I felt like my kids, because I was especially watching them, I, I felt like they did definitely... I, I think Rand was the most relatable to them. Um, but... And and Matt, they really liked, and just because great character, great acting, great uh, adaptation of the character. Everybody else was like, okay, yeah. And now, you really care about everybody in the book. There's just not a character that you don't care about. Now, on his on his um sub on on his um subreddit, um someone had speculated that he found the violence of the series objectionable, and Sanderson. Because he, because he's because he actually listens to his fan base, yeah, a, mo- a model citizen for us all. Um, <laughs> had reve- had re- had revealed hit had revealed his actual issues and elaborated on it. Because because mm-hmm. one because one user had had said that that what was done to Perrin was what was what he found objectionable, and he said mostly Perrin. Objectionable might not be the right term here. Also, the gore has been a little over the top in places. Not to get spoilers, mm-hmm. but there are several later scenes that made my wife pretty nauseous. Yeah. And given that you mentioned that you're sit that you're yeah, just... she, anytime she came back in the room and there was a scene that was where she's like, "This is too violent for me." Mm-hmm. Oh, he then said, "I wouldn't, for example, show the show to any of my kids, and I let them play Doom Eternal. Granted, that gore is cartoony right. and over the top on purpose." Yeah. But that's a smaller issue. I think the team is doing a great job in general, but I do wish it weren't trying so hard to be grim and dour. Yeah, I, I, I w- I'll give him that. Uh, I, it was definitely trying hard to to say, "Hey, we can we we even though it's the wheel of time, we can we can we can hang with you, bros. You know, we can we can hang with the cool kids." And uh, you didn't need to. The Wheel of Time stands on its own. It didn't need that. It, that, that I think that that point that he made earlier on in, in one of the quotes you gave, I think it's his best point that he's made. The Wheel of Time does stand on its own, and it really didn't need any of that additional stuff. Now, supposedly Raph Judkins is who, one of the showrunners who could be considered the captain of the ship, but okay. the, problem that we, the problem that we've had is... Each episode has a different director. They have a different opening, right. and right. they have a different person who's credited with adapting. So, right. are they are they really captaining that ship? Because it doesn't I, feel that way. I think some something that I, that a lot of pe- a lot of people um, don't. I don't think they fully grasp with with the concept of who the captain of the ship is. Is that when you are in that position, every you have to. You have the, you have the responsibility of having the final say on everything. I yes. know some people think that you can, that that's something that can be done by committee. It really can't. No, it really even can't. If, even and if I you fully do it agree by, with you. even if you do it by committee, somebody ha- somebody has to swing the gavel at the end of the day. 
you're absolutely right. And, and, and stories and adaptations and, and genres, I mean, all of this works ultimately best in that way. I mean, it, it works that way even with my own team. Every, there, I have a great team involved in Planet Bound at this point, and they, it all, everybody knows that I'm the one that makes the final call. It's oh. just it, it, when you don't when and Peter Jackson, who you mentioned earlier, is a perfect example of that. In fact, man almost died <laughs> from you know health issues because of how much he was the captain of that ship called Lord of the Rings. Yeah, and the and and he went ahead and did it again when it came to the Hobbit. Mm-hmm. But he there was nothing that didn't go by the man. There was nothing, uh, and that was an ex- talk about an extensive project i mean you're talking every single helmet every single arrow every single everything is going by the man to go yep yep nope nope yep nope Mm -hmm. and uh that's is what a captain of a ship is and what you get with that so when people we we do we do i i hate to mention a gaming aspect of things but we we do (laughs) we live in a world these days where we think that the committee is is a great way of doing everything and i'm not saying that committees aren't important meaning having teams around the captain is critical the captain cannot do it on his own peter jackson would never have been able to accomplish what he did on his own I'm however fa- i'm a big fan of um riku sanjo as a writer and even he has admitted that he writes best when he has somebody to, work, to bounce off of um yeah when when his, when his manga beat the va- <coughs> the Vandal Buster had his um had his co writer and artist um have to take a break because of health issues he put the whole manga on hold. Yeah, I get it. And you know, I've had I've had great mm-hmm. people to bounce Planet Bound off of over over the years, and great people involved that have all played a part. But in, without the captain, it just still doesn't work because. You, you said that that gavel comes down to go, yes, here's the call. And the call is going to be consistent. And what I think is so important is that the captain has a set of values, has a set of standards that they're able to check against. So Peter Jackson insanely had his whole token world built everything as his standard that was right by him. And he knew it backwards and forwards. So everything that came into his you know, locus of control, he was able to very quickly go, yep, nope, yep, nope, yep, nope, yep, that works, this doesn't work, and uh, as as being consistent with this. And so you don't have that with this, and it's clear you don't have that with this. Have you ever seen the film Moneyball? No, I don't think so. It's, I, know some peop- I know some people might say that I'm committing blasphemy for, for <laughs> nerds by, bring, by bringing up sports, but Moneyball is a... Um, Loose adaptation of the life of um, leg- legendary Oakland A's GM Billy Bean. Mm. The guy, the guy who, the guy who took it, the guy who took a team that had no business, a baseball team that had no business being at being anywhere of note, and managed to get them into the playoffs. Nice by pl- by play by playing uh, by playing the math. Basically, okay. basically by by util- by utilizing a lot a lot of analytics that are used by teams nowadays and going with going with guys that were available on the cheap from uh, from other teams whether whether it be declines whether it be t- whether it be people who just weren't performing that could be that could be gotten for less than a million each some yeah of them, some of them less than ha- less than half of a million but all the pieces to the puzzle he needed though yeah and be, and the big reason that he did it is because he had he had lost one of his top one of his top guys to uh, Boston, and when speaking with the owner, the owner wasn't willing to increase the payroll. So if you if if you're play, if you play like if you play like the big market teams without that kind of money, you're gonna lose you're gonna lose to the big market teams. I.e., what's wor- what was what. It, the traditional methods weren't working, so we need to do something different. And mm. there's a scene early on where his scouts have issue with it because he's go because he's not going with any of the teams with the intangible any of the uh, players with the intangibles that they're all suggesting to him. Uh. But one of them says, so- says something that I think is 
ver that is very fitting for this. I'm saying, and I'm somewhat paraphrasing, but and he's he was the oldest scout in the, on the table. Says, I think you have to understand this man does this man does not answer to anyone but ownership and God. We make suggestions, he makes decisions. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Exactly. And, and that's what the captain of the ship does. Yeah. Now, it has been it has been well a lot of people have talked about how Bezos really, really wants his own Game of Thrones. And while I don't while I don't have any concrete information on that, I very I very much could see I could see uh, it. Could see and could see him interfering and saying, "Make it more like Game of Thrones." Okay, I could see that. If only, uh, if only and... because the if only because a high a higher up producer interfering with interfering with a work to to adhere to some kind of vision or some kind of half baked idea is not a new issue. <laughs> right. Oh no, not even a little. Oh. Uh, especially in something like that. Um, Meaning uh, something like Amazon Prime or even Paramount Plus, just uh, just, okay. any, just in filmmaking. Period. There are filmmaking even period, before right. the age of streaming, there were plenty. There has been plenty of stories of sure of of a higher up in, of a higher up interfering for one reason or another. Right. Um, in I can see it, uh, but and here's and, and these people want to make money and. I still, in the end, feel the best way you're going to make money off of something like this is if the people who are familiar with the material are who your it factor is, meaning your your not just your target market, because your target market is much be bigger than this. But if your it factor, meaning the guys who are loyal to this, that these people are willing to talk about it and go, holy smokes, this is the best thing since sliced bread, then they're going to talk it, then everybody's going to watch it. Because the people that love it are doing nothing but talking it up. You want to know what's why, a good I mean, case in point with that? Mandalorian is a great example of that. You want to know what's a good case in point with that? What? How the how the Sonic movies have been treated, both the both the one we got a, the one we got a couple, a couple years ago and the one we mm -hmm. just got. Which, mm -hmm. um, Somebody and somebody on the server ended up making a meme about somebody ended up making a meme about it with the whole want to see to want to with the whole want to see me upstage a Marvel movie want to see me do it again right <laughs> because, because 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 the people who love Sonic were just like there you go well the big thing that's the big thing that helped and the big thing that the club really hated was the director outright listening to the studio outright listening to the fans right because everybody w reacted so negatively to that, to that original yeah correct trailer and they holy smokes we can't do we got wait 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 uh yeah i i know i haven't seen the second one but uh by the end of the first one i was like dang that felt like sonic the hedgehog mm -hmm. and I know some people say that that the CG studio got bankrupted in the process. No, it just got sh it just got shuttered and everybody got mo and everybody got shuffled to other things. It wasn't a bankruptcy. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't know, but I did that doesn't sound right that it was a bankruptcy. No. It's one, it's one of those things that's that I've seen some people use to gaslight cuz there's right. the club has had has had a tr has had this track record of Believing that they are the tastemakers, yes. And, which is which is why you hear, which is why whenever there's pushback, you always you always see hit pieces in the Atlantic or the Hollywood Reporter or the like about them complaining on toxic fandom. Correct. And and these are the ones that very much are in favor of the committee, and that everybody should have a say. And and well, I'll go to the RPG world of things that there shouldn't be a GM that everybody is the GM and everybody is making the decisions about what happens in the game. Okay, great. So there are some games that can be played GMless, but they are specifically designed around that. Um, they're designed around that, and not for everybody to have 
input like everybody is the one telling the story when you do that i don't know that that's successful or not i haven't seen it myself the, and you the last more game the, the, the last game that i saw that did that did it was mystic imperian and right. its approach was not that there is no gm but that the GM is a round robin position that rotates around the table. Okay, but, but that still works because you still have a captain at some point. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, got got it, and, and and that's fun. That's an interesting idea around the concept. Okay, great. If we're even if they were to do something like that, even if we're going to establish, okay, we're going to round robin these. So you know, the, each episode has its own adapter, and this is the part that you're going to adapt, and this is the part that you're going to adapt. Well, then. What kind of is fun about that is when you really don't be consistent then. When you, when you like, uh, when you, uh, uh, I'd say uh, the way to, I'd say the way to get it, the, the best, the best use of that sort of multiple directors, writers kind of thing is when you're doing an anthology work, like a few examples of which being, um, the Animatrix, Halo Legends, sure. yes. and Batman Gotham Knight. But it even can be done in something consistent. I think Daybreak, which unfortunately never got its second season, and it's just one of my loves of anything Netflix ever did, was was every episode was done off of a different genre. The first episode was like 80s movies where the main character talks to the audience. And the second episode is an, an anime done in the style of anime. And then the third episode is up to when it's like 80s comedy. Every, but it's a completely consistent story, and it's telling the one story from beginning to end. But every episode is completely distinct on its own. It can be done that way if you're going to do it that way. But when you are trying to do something consistent and you don't have a captain, you're not. You just you're running into all the problems that we're talking about in this series. Mm -hmm. And for that for that reason, I think the I think the is I think the big fit. If someone were to, if someone were to try again at Wheel of Time in five or t in five or ten years, yeah, um, you're gonna need to leave this one alone for a while. Yeah, let pe let people go through the grieving process, for lack of a better right. word. But there's a few thing there's a few bullet points I think should should be taken into account for whoever tries in an, in another date. One, be be far be have a bigger connection with the audience. Yeah. If that does if that does that mean go, does that mean doing the con scene? Yes. Does that mean doing AMAs on Reddit? Yes. Does that mean um, connecting with connecting with fans through through you through YouTube or Twitch? Yes. 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 And yes. Any of those you can do to to per, to give off the idea of. I of I am a fan who's who's working on so, who's working on a dream project, because in the yes. wake of what happened with Kevin Smith's attempt at Masters of the Universe, the whole idea oh. of a, of the of the fan celeb ended up getting broken, and that was something I made very clear when I covered yeah uh, Masters of the Universe Revelation that yeah this is going to cause long term damage for the idea of somebody famous being a fan of an IP. Yes. Um, and also doing that, you know, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that whoever's making the thing should be kowtowing to the fandom. That no. I I don't need that either. But what I do need is it very clear that you love and care about this thing, and that you are taking care of this thing. That you are treating it as something precious because it is precious to a lot mm -hmm. of people. So if that's clear that you're doing that in whatever interaction you're having with the fandom and in the actual production itself, then we all go, wow. Mm -hmm. Thank I mean, Peter Jackson, thank you for taking care of something we care about so much. Um, and even even if there's somebody who who doesn't have that fan background, if they're if they're making a show that they're taking the effort to learn, that's going to come right. through. Um, it will come through absolutely. One of my, one of my fa one of my favorite stories in that regard, and this is again me bringing up Star Trek, is in is in regard to Harv Bennett, who is the mm. producer for The Wrath of Khan. Okay. He, was, he was mainly brought he was mainly brought in because he had more ex he had more experience and more in um science fiction, and more importantly, he knew how to maintain a budget, which was a significant problem. <laughs> With um, the motionless picture, right? But 
he when he came onto the project, he had not seen a single episode of Star Trek. Oh wow! So in preparation, he ended up blitzing through the entire series, took notes along the way, in order to form in order to format what they should do with with a sequel. Brilliant. And of course, he de- he decided to base he decided to base a lot of his notes around the episode Space Seed, even right. the, even though Space Seed was never had any real plans for follow ups. Sure. No. But he f- he felt that Khan was just too was just too good of an opportunity to pass up. Yeah. Um, and and good on him. And these thing the thing about the thing about it is that he is that he um he took he took the he took the work that he was doing seriously in that in that regard. There yeah. were there were a few there were a few complications, namely. Roddenberry, le- Roddenberry leaked leaked the script that was planned, which got the fans pretty pissed off. So there was a bit of doubling and shifting, and the only reason he was able to get Nimoy to agree to the project was by promising that Spock would die, because Nimoy was on bad terms with Paramount right. and Gene at the time. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> but e- the se- the second thing and this is this is all this is also important is all roads have to lead to that one captain of the ship yeah he and and he has to he has to oversee and he has to oversee ev- everything and i am yeah. not saying that that is an easy thing to do but no it has happened enough times that you can't say that you can't do it that's right uh that is, and I think that you just hit the nail on the head, because what will often be said is, "Man, this is just too big of a project. This is just too big of a. This is just too. It has been done." So I, I, I disagree wholeheartedly that you cannot find a captain of this ship called the Wheel of Time. I, I, I remember, see, I remember seeing people claim that, um, Dune is unada- is unadaptable. Right. I heard people exclaim that from the hilltops. And I even wondered myself, you know, when they said they were going to do this, I, I was just like, you know, I'm keeping an open mind. I'll see what they do. Uh, and boy, to me, they hit it out of the park. Um, Daniel Villeneuve did a, did, a ver- did a very, very good job with what, he's, with what he was given and splitting it into two par- Splitting the film in two is the smart move to make. Absolutely. I know. I know that some people really had really had a problem with cer- with certain changes that were made. Yeah. But as far as I'm concerned, if you if you can do the if you can do the project um, properly, and it, as as it, as a i.e. you can watch the thing on its own and and manage to make it work. But oh, if absolutely. that's too if that's too big of a thing, um, let me bring up Watchmen. Because right. that was another one that had that had stop start um, adapt- adaptation stories for years, and while I am not saying that Snyder's attempt was perfect, there were cert- there were certain issues, and the ending is up for debate. I think he I think he was a- I think he was able to succeed at getting a large amount of the story. Yeah, which is saying something when you have to try and condense. A graph, a graphic novel of that density, into yes. a into a film. Um, I specifically, heard... I would say to that the density aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Frank Herbert didn't write a massive novel. We're not talking about the Wheel of Time things, but talk about dense. Uh, the Watchmen isn't like twenty volumes, but it is dense. It is uh, it is dense regarding all of the regarding all of the moving parts as well as the fact that correct he um he kept adhering to that three by three panel style yeah so he had to get as much as he could in each in each panel yeah and in the in that sa- in that same vein uh, I will the the Gib- the Studio Ghibli adaptation of um, Earthsea is actually is actually pretty decent it's it, is it i haven't seen it it is a little it is a little um violent in places but 
it is far, far from being as bad as the sci-fi adaptation. Okay. Which, I would rant about how much how bad that was, but Le Guin did it for me. <laughs> right. She awesome. really hated it. Yeah. And you don't need Ursula up in your business. <laughs> no. But... The, but the point with the point with all these is that it ca- is that it can be done, and culturally speaking, we there is still a degree of reverence for auteur theory. There's been that re- that reverence has been pre- has been present in film and television culture ev- ever since the 70s. Mm-hmm. The Id- the idea of the director as this so- as the sole as the sole authority, or this idea of a uh-huh. showrunner as a sole authority. A lot of that comes from the new Hollywood that was ushered by the movie Brats. Sure. And you already know their names. Yep. But the point the point is, is that with now will there now if if someone was to do that hypothetical, would would they have to address whether whether or not um would they have to address the wokeness issue that's that people had ra- that people had raised with the version that we've been discussing for the last couple hours i would say i would say the easiest way to deal with that issue is is by saying we are we are trying to by saying something to the extent of we're trying to present the epic that Ro- that robert jordan told since 1990 in as in as authentic as a matter as possible. Mm-hmm. Will there be some people who who have who take issue with that? There will probably be some people yelling at Twitter, but who gives a shit because Twitter is not a real place. Correct, and not only that, but that will be so, even though that's very loud and it is very loud. It's very small. Oh, uh, and and it, it's unfortunate that we've come to a place. So I say where. Have people have in, in entertainment because it no longer is entertainment in a lot of ways. And again, I will give Wheel of Time props because they didn't virtue signal off of this stuff, even though they were very inclusive in that what would be considered that woke way. Uh, they, okay, they didn't virtue signal though. They didn't make it a thing. They didn't say, hey, look at us, we're doing this. At least not that I saw. There were people that were talking about it but they weren't touting it from the hilltops. So I'll give them that because I think that that's the way to do it. Just show it. Jim Henson is the, the my favorite, uh, th- this old interview as they were in about the second season of Sesame Street. Uh, and uh, they were talking to, what's his name? The guy who was the producer of Sesame Street and writer. I can't remember his name. And then one of the other writers. Mm-hmm. And they're sitting there on, on, on the street of Sesame Street. And they're inter- being interviewed by NBC or ABC, something like that. And the guy's going, so gosh, and this is what they called it at the time, instead of something woke or diverse or anything, they're going, you're, you've, you've represented this incredible um, uh, integrated cast, you know, on this show. And they stared at the guy and they just shook their head smiling. And the guy goes, did you have anything to say about that? He goes, they said, there is nothing to say about that. It, we just show it. And that is the, and of course, and we all accepted the diversity of Sesame Street on an inner city block called Sesame Street, and we didn't think anything of it. There was no racial conversation around it, except for maybe some offshoot people that were having that conversation. Other than that, we all just accepted it as what so, because that's, they just showed it. Mm -hmm. When you do that, great. When you virtue signal, it doesn't work, so I say. So if they're going to do it, do not see the emperor in his new clothes. Correct. Don't say anything about it. Just do it, mm-hmm. and or do what you just said, which is brilliant. To go, you know what? We 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 uh, are going to homage this incredible work uh, from a man named Robert Jordan, who is no longer with us, who in, who in create, created an incredible piece of fantasy, and that's what we're choosing to mm-hmm. stay true to. Yeah, and and that includes a very very strong juxtaposition between males and females. Yeah. And I'd say if you, I'd say if you do that, you'll have you'll have at least a better chance. And given and even with everything that I said, there is still the possibility that that attempt may fail. But that is the yes. risk that you take when you're when That's you're it. taking on this kind of project. Period. Yes. Yep. 
but I think I think that about I think that about covers everything in this particular um, therapy session. We covered it pretty good, I have to say. Mm-hmm. So I will. We will see you all next time around as with an, with another Geek Watch special that I that was a bit of an audible on my part because after t- after covering what seemed like the end of an era for for Ring of Honor, now. I feel I need to cover its rebirth. So that'll be a that'll be a subject for an for another night. So until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, and join the watch. <laughs>